No, no, I'm happy to talk. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm in favor of publicity for it at any time. As I told Gray, I have a lot of respect for Gray. He got involved creating videos way at the beginning, and I was very impressed with the work he did. Had we ever had we ever gotten to a point of having a triable case, I might well have hired him to produce some graphics for me because he did really wonderful work. And he and I have communicated on and off over the last couple of years, and I do trust him. So what can I do for you, Mike? Well, I'm, my name is Rob Ives. I was the prosecuting attorney in Carroll County uh, at the time that Abby and Libby were murdered. And in addition to that, I was the prosecuting attorney for a prolonged period of time afterwards during the period of time, particularly when the FBI was in Carroll County in great force. Well, most recently for seven years, but uh, overall, I was the prosecuting attorney in Carroll County about 18 years. Well, when there's a really major felony uh, in a small county, Carroll County is 20,000 people, 380 square miles, a highly agricultural county. There aren't very many people there. And when there's a major crime, a murder, uh, rape, uh, even most burglaries, though I don't always know as a prosecutor there's been a burglary that's occurred. When a really major crime's occurred, they're going to contact us. And while I am not involved in uh, the crime scene, forensic work, and so on. I was out on the day uh, the bodies were discovered. No, it's it's typical. You know, I, I don't know in really big counties or urban areas, probably not. But in for me and for my deputy, Mr. Bean and I are we're both longtime prosecutors. When we're talking about a major crime scene, a murder. The main reason we want to go is not to tell the police how to do their job, but so that when people are explaining the crime scene to us, that we have a context in which to put that explanation. So if there's a murder scene at a house or outdoors or any place like that, I was always going to want to go. Well, to a limited extent in a major case, Sometimes prosecutors may make suggestions to the police. We may have our own ideas about some follow-up that might be done, but generally we don't run those investigations. But uh, certainly in Carroll County and with the Indiana State Police and the Carroll County Sheriff's Department, we all get along really well and we work together really well and they're interested in my opinions. But more importantly, as cases go on, subpoenas need to be issued and search warrants need to be issued. And so I need to be familiar with the facts because I produce all that. Or when I was the prosecuting attorney, I produced all that material. And thus, the more I know about the case, the easier it is for me to understand what it is they want to do and why they can do it. And sometimes as a prosecutor, you guys say, no, we just don't have enough to get that. We need to get more. Or alternatively, uh, you know, the police sometimes convince us, no, we've got this and this and this. And sometimes, you know, we become convinced they're correct. We don't want to be going to a judge asking for uh, investigative materials, search warrants or subpoenas or similar things without having a, a proper foundation for that. Well, it's really difficult. As I've told uh, Mr. Hughes on several occasions, the difficulty is, first of all, I'm afraid I'm not going to remember details correctly. And secondarily, I want to be very careful that I'm not releasing information that the investigators haven't decided to release. There are good reasons why information is not released. Sometimes the police want to know things that suspects don't know. And in addition, they want to know things that if a person tries to make a confession for publicity purposes, you know, as, as you know, no doubt, sometimes people confess to things they didn't do. You want to make sure that you know things about the crime scene that are not readily available to the public. And thus, I have to be really careful. I, I can tell you, uh, I, I do recall when the girls were reported missing because it's not unusual for teenagers to be missing for a period of, you know, an hours or a day because they've run off. You know, they've run off to Canada. I actually had two young people run off to Canada one time and Generally, you think, oh, well, they'll turn up tomorrow, they'll turn up the day after. And the next day, it was shocking when the, the girls were found dead. And so 
you know, it was it, the crime scene is at the end of a walking trail. And one thing that has been reported very well is the bridge that's shown in the pictures is not actually on the walking trail. The bridge is not safe to cross, but people crossed it all the time. In fact, one factoid, which you may already know, is that a lot has been made sometimes of the fact that the suspect is looking down as he walks. Well, he's looking down as he walks because anybody walking across a bridge has to look down because that bridge has not been in railroad operation since, I believe, 1987. And so it's not in very good shape, and you have to watch your step to cross it. Well, there's there's no law on the subject. And one thing that's hard, I've had to explain to people in the past, in Indiana, in some states, I understand in New York, the prosecuting attorney is actually at the top of the chain of command of all his local police departments. But in Indiana, the prosecutor is not in the chain of command. The prosecutor can ask the police to do things. He can tell them to do things. He can embarrass them if necessary. But he really can't order them to do anything because he's not in the chain of command. Now, in reality, the police are extremely cooperative. And they don't want to cross prosecutors. They don't want to be in the doghouse with prosecutors. But on something like this, it's more a question of what makes good sense. Prosecutors are not investigators. I, there's nothing legally that prevent me from releasing anything. But I'm not a professional investigator. The detectives in the state police and the leadership in the state police make judgments about what they think should and should not be released. And I was never going to second guess those judgments. Now, I, I guess I sh don't misunderstand me. If I thought they were doing something horribly wrong, I might have released something else. But I didn't have that feeling. And I wasn't going to second guess their decisions about such matters. I think I think if anybody looked at all the various evidence, any two people would have slightly different opinions about what should and should not be released. But I'm not interested in second guessing them on that. You know, the one thing that I don't think was emphasized enough, even though it was certainly released, was the fact that the image of the suspect is an image from a video from a cell phone camera at great distance. People kept asking, well, why don't they enhance that picture? Why don't they make that picture? Well, there's no pixels to enhance. There just aren't very many pixels there. And so they did a marvelous job, really, of getting that picture up to the quality it, it is. And I know that's confused people out in the public. Why, why don't? Because there's no magic, as you know. I mean, you have X number of pixels. Those pixels are a certain color. It may be that you can enhance the image by adding to the contrast or reducing the contrast, but you can't do anything to change the fact you have X number of pixels making up a picture. And as such, you only have certain resolution when you're dealing with a picture like that. There is a lot of crime scene evidence. Uh, some of it is somewhat odd, but, but when I say that any murder scene tends to have odd facts about it. I mean, in real life, obviously, people don't kill people really all that often. And this crime scene, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of unique facts there. And honestly, I'm shocked, and I promise you the police are shocked, that it wasn't solved in a day or two because it just didn't seem – we're not used to in rural Indiana. Normally, if person A murders person B, it's obvious – who the suspects are. And usually it's pretty obvious how to prove they committed the crime. This crime is very strange. Uh, but, but let me put this, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I mean, the crime scene was physically strange, but that's for the state police to turn to decide what to release, and not release. I've said that before. It's, it's very odd. That, it's kind of hard to answer that because in a case like this, they probably weren't going to make an arrest without talking to me or talking to whoever the prosecutor was at the time first to make sure that we all agreed there was enough. You know, obviously police make decisions to arrest people all the time. And if someone confessed or there was some piece of physical evidence, DNA evidence or such 
that linked a person closely to a crime, well, they're going to go ahead and make an arrest. On a case like this, if you were building it up from a pile of facts, then you're probably going to consult with your prosecutor to determine, do you think this is enough? That's what, that's what in my experience, experienced detectives, experienced investigators know that they need to do that if they're building up a case on circumstantial facts. But if you, if you had enough to file, what you do as a prosecutor is you deal with the people most closely related to the investigation and you go over and over the facts. What can we do to bolster this case? What can we do to make sure that we've covered every possibility? And in addition, you try to look ahead to think if there was a defense attorney involved, what would they, what holes would they try to make in this case? What can we do to fill in those holes? And so when you're dealing with something like this, where the penalties are so grossly severe and the, the chance of going to trial is extremely high because you're just not going to plead people out to cases like this. Or even if you are, you're going to have to have an overwhelming case to convince them that they need to take a, a ridiculously, uh, I shouldn't say ridiculous, a horrendously strong penalty. Then what you're trying to do, as I say, with the police is you're going over and over. Do we have this covered? We have this covered. We have this covered. We have every piece of physical evidence that we send every single thing to the lab. Uh, is there anything else that we've forgotten that would make this case stronger? Is there anything else we've forgotten that would prevent a weakness from appearing that doesn't really exist? Because obviously one defense line is always, well, the police didn't do this. The police didn't do that. They didn't do this. The state didn't do this. And so sometimes you do things, you take steps that you don't really believe are going to produce any evidence, but you want to be able to tell a jury, no, we tried that. We tried to do that. In the old days, uh, when I say the old days, 20 years ago, I mean, the big thing always was, well, they didn't take fingerprints. We're going, well, there's no identification issue. Well, juries still don't understand why you didn't take those fingerprints. So as you guys say, you throw the dust around and you look for fingerprints everywhere you can. And in today's world, you certainly look for DNA every place you can. You look for fiber evidence every place you can, uh, footprints, uh, you know, any all sorts of little uh physical material evidence of the sort that, you know, you read about in every mystery novel. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing, and this can be a problem sometimes with inexperienced police officers. Well, it's obvious. And you, yes, it's obvious to me. It's obvious to you, but we never know what is enough to be obvious to a group of jurors. And so we don't say, Oh, we have X. That's enough. If we can get Y and Z, then we get Y and Z it. Also, because you never know when you go to a jury with a case and you say, we have proof beyond a reasonable doubt, not just that we think he did it, not that he probably did it, that, not that we're fairly sure, but proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you have got to bring everything you've got. Because just because I believe it or you believe it, you have to know that 12 people who are not familiar with law enforcement, not familiar with crime scenes, and who are instructed that they're to assume that defendant is not guilty, they're going to want a lot of evidence. And so you want to make sure you have everything. And what may be important to Mike or Rob, to juror number 11, they, some other fact might be the really important fact to them. What, what people think is relevant has often surprised me. And so you shouldn't assume that, oh, well, A plus B equals C. They, they might want to know a few more things. And so and it's it's a it's a problem sometimes because when you're a prosecutor, you try a lot of cases and you see the things that go wrong. Police officers, some police officers go their whole career and never have to testify at a jury trial. And so sometimes not detectives, not experienced detectives, they'll they'll not understand why are you being so picky about this? Well, we're being so picky about this because you never know what that last fact is important. You never know what that last convincing fact will be that will make a juror vote guilty because it's a, you're asking a lot of people to vote guilty in a criminal case. I, 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 I am not going to, I don't want to speculate about that because that's not my decision. That would be Mr. McClellan's decision. I don't want to put him in a position where, well, Rob Ives said he'd do X. Uh, you, you could look at the Indiana law and you could see the penalties are extremely harsh for a multiple murder. And probably what you would imagine. And I don't know what the tactical decision making would be by whoever is responsible for this case to determine what they what charges they'd file. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I will say this. I, I thought initially it had to be somebody local, as people have said. And now I really don't know. I, I guess I'm afraid it might be somebody who happened to be there at the right time. There was no logical reason anybody would have known those girls were going to be there that day. Um, and a lot of investigation went into determining, did anybody know? And I, I don't know if you know this, Mike, but it, the reason they were out there in the most general sense was, is was an outrageously beautiful day for February. I believe it wasn't a February date. Yes. Yes. And it was, I believe it was in the low fifties. It was in the fifties and sunny, which in Carroll County, Indiana is outrageously warm for February. And so I believe they just took advantage of that. Oh, it's a nice day. Let's go for a walk. And a lot of people did that. And so I don't know. I've never seen anything that would lead me to believe that anybody would have known they were coming. That, I, I can say that as of the time I last knew the facts, I had no reason to believe anybody knew they're coming. Now, if the police know that now, and I hope they do, I'm not aware of that. A person with no conscience, I mean, a sociopath. I, I, you know, the, the, the best of my knowledge, and you can tell me, there's no, the the method of uh, murder has never been released. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So I'd rather not comment on that. Even though I was a prosecutor for 22 years, I am not. My experience does not encompass anything in any way related to this case. Yeah, as I say, in big cities, maybe they have situations like this. You have a multiple murder. There's no logical suspect. And you can't figure out, you know, you, you can't come up with chargeable evidence over a long period of time. But that's very, very odd from my experience. And so the, the tactical decisions or maybe strategic decisions the police make about what they're going to release or not release I'm not really familiar. I, I can't, I have nothing to compare it to. And, and I am not a trained investigator. I'm just, a, I'm a trained lawyer. I, I, I'm a trained prosecutor. I think I was good at that, but I'm not going to tell investigators the best way to investigate. I, I, I'm still stunned by it to think that we had a crime scene. We had bodies within 24 hours of their death that we had a video recording and an audio recording. I would have thought, and I promise you, everybody else thought we're never going to have this much evidence. I mean, and there's, as I say, there's more that we have all these facts, some of them somewhat unusual. And there's, going to be something about these facts that's going to point to somebody. I, I'm shocked. I'm stunned. But when I say that, I don't mean that I think anybody failed. Many, many great police officers have worked their tails off on this. And it's just, they just aren't finding it. And there were promising leads at one time or another. Uh, amazing things, but they didn't lead to the, you know, they didn't lead to a person that was even close to chargeable. People have speculated, well, maybe there's somebody out there. I can tell you this. There was never a point while I was prosecutor that we thought, oh, just a little bit more, we'll charge this person. There is no such person there, while I was there. I hope there is now, but there was no such person when I was there. I, 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 I I, I know there was DNA evidence that was not from the girls at the crime scene, and, and which is what you know, and that's really all I know. I have very little experience with composite check, sketches because normally, in my experience, which was in Tippecanoe County and Carroll County and Clinton County, which are all Indiana County's Tiffany County being a bigger county, but when I was there many years ago, I was not handling major felonies. My experience 
the use of these sketches, which I know from news reports and from history that it's amazing how good these sketches can be, how accurate they can be, how closely they can resemble the person. At least they closely resemble the person that's being described to the sketch artist. And so they're really helpful when you're trying to find an unknown person. But as I say, in Carroll County, while I've prosecuted several murders, I've been involved in several murder investigations or death investigations, we never had a situation where the, the question was always how we were going to prove the person did it. It wasn't who the suspect was. We had no unknown suspect. You know, there was a there was a love triangle case that also arose here in the last couple of years. And in that case, it it was not very, very long at all after the murder that we figured out, OK, it's this other person is the logical suspect and he was tried and convicted. So it just hasn't come up. I think it's a real, it's very valuable because it, I say it's amazing. If you say, I saw this person on February 17th and he was walking through the park and the sketch artist talks to you and talks you through what this person looked like. It's amazing how closely they'll come up with a picture that resembles that person. But that's only helpful when you're looking for an unknown person. And I don't know the history behind the change of the sketches. I was not around for the decision, oh, this sketch is wrong and this sketch is right. I, I don't know what that was all about. Well, it's it's terribly disappointing. I mean, first of all, that's such a horrible crime. Carroll County is a peaceful, <laughs> safe place. Nationally, people were making comments. I can't believe that those girls were out there. From my office in downtown Delphi to out to the crime scene, you could walk there in 20 minutes or half an hour. It, it just wasn't out in the middle of nowhere. It's not talking like a national forest. It's just down a trail just outside of town. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere. And I would never have hesitated when my child was that age to say, oh, yeah, you can walk down the trail. But I would have said, don't go on that bridge. But that's a different issue. That's just a bridge safety issue. The It was horrible to me because... I guess let me put it this way, Mike. People would say to me, I did work a lot of hours in the six weeks after that crime was committed because we were sending out subpoenas and I was trying to help the guys with technical issues, making sure their printers were working and their laptops were working. And I would come in seven days a week, just like all the cops were doing. And people would say to me, oh, Rob, you know, you must be exhausted. I feel so sorry for you. I said, no, don't feel sorry for me. This is my job and I love doing it. The people to feel sorry for are these little girls and their families. It's horrible. I mean, it's just, it's far and away, well, along with the four girls that were killed in the fire in Florida, that period of time and those deaths are the worst thing that I can ever recall. And I grew up in Carroll County and lived there my whole life. It's just as crimes, they're just horrifying. And then for me, it was very frustrating. A lot of people are working really hard and officers are coming from all these surrounding counties to help. And a lot of really sharp people are working really hard. And it's so frustrating that we can't get find any justice. It's all it's horrible. And it, it bothers me today. And I, I wish I wish they would get a breakthrough and I wish there was something else I could do to help. But I don't know what there is I can do to help. So as as a frustration for in my career, it's by a huge margin, the the worst case, the worst crime, and the most frustrating outcome so far that I can recall. Well, I don't know. I I, I felt strongly, you know, I was very lucky. The gentleman, Jerry Bean, was my chief deputy, and Jerry had been the prosecuting attorney in Tipping County for, I believe, 16 years. And probably there wasn't a more experienced prosecutor in the state of Indiana than Jerry, if there were, there were very, very few. And so I felt very strongly that we were ready and able to do the job, that I wanted to catch the person that committed this crime. I wanted to prosecute him. I wanted to convict him. I wanted to make sure it got done. And so I'm frustrated by that, but that's trivial. I mean, what's important, as I say, is that we can't save the girls, but can we get some justice for their families and some closure for them? Because it, everything about it is so horrible. I, I, whether I did it or didn't do it is not important. What's important is that it gets done.
well, I think this person's going to get caught and I think they're going to get convicted. But I guess what I'm afraid of now, it might be one of these situations where somebody gets caught two years from now or six years from now and admits to something. And then as part of a deal, as we have seen in the past with serial killers, they'll say, oh, I also did this other one. As long as you don't give me the death penalty or some similar thing, I'll tell you about that. I don't say that's what this person is. I don't say this person's a serial killer. Uh, all I can say is, is that generally, what I tell people all the time, people get really worried about murder, but if you're not living in an area where there is, there are common disputes over drug territory, generally the only people that kill it, you only get killed by your friends. You only get killed by your relatives. If you can trust your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, because almost all murders in rural Indiana are crimes of passion. Somebody's really mad about something. You're not killed by a stranger. They don't kill you to take your wallet. You know, they don't kill you just to hijack your car. They kill you because they're mad about some romantic relationship or some family relationship or something like that. That's what happens. Uh, I mean, I've had cases two times in Carroll County. Grandsons killed grandparents because the grandparents wouldn't give them money. That seems ridiculous, but they were people that knew each other that had a dispute of a family emotional nature. That's the sort of murder that we would have in rural Indiana. This is not like that. There is no apparent motive. There's no logical reason for it. It makes no sense. It makes no sense that anybody would murder somebody where this murder occurred. And in fact, if you go out to this, I've told Gray Hughes, I'd like to go out there with him. You go out there, there's actually at least one house that you can look down from a property, a residential property, and see where these bodies were found. It's not totally isolated out there. Well, I had, I, it's terrible speculation. I mean, yes, I do, because... With human nature being what it is, it's hard for me to believe that anybody could do something so bizarre and horrible and not feel compelled to tell somebody about it. There was honest to goodness a case in Carroll County many years ago. We have a tremendous state police detective named Herb Clear, where the case started because a fellow in a bar in Japan on military duty was talking to somebody else and said that people had been murdered in Carroll County. The word got back. It got to the state police. Herb Clear, who was an incredible detective, found these bodies buried on a farm. And they were talking, gosh, what year? we're talking 30 years ago now. And it was started because somebody couldn't help but talk about it. And it's an incredible, incredible case from, from many years ago. And maybe I, I take too much from that experience, but my experience in human nature is, is that I just can't believe somebody could commit this crime and not feel compelled to tell some either to confess to it or to brag about it or to at least hint at it. So I've always believed that somebody does know. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they don't want to believe the truth of it. Uh, and maybe there's somebody out there so self-disciplined they could commit this horrible crime and never tell anybody or hint at it. But it, it just seems impossible to me. I can't give you a number, but the problem with that is people, you know, we, we did searches and so on. And so people would think, oh, the search is here. So so-and-so must commit that crime. And that's a terrible, terrible uh, jump to make in your reasoning. It, that's just not what was going on. And so I don't know how many persons of interest, you know, you, you could take particular police officers. They may have said, well, maybe so-and-so could have done it. Maybe so-and-so could have done it. You know, you look around, you go, who, who was available? Who could have possibly had any motivation? But in my opinion, there, as I told you before, there's, there never was, while I was the prosecuting attorney, a person that we said, well, we're pretty close to charging this person. We think they did it, but we can't quite prove it. That person has never existed. Now, other people may have different opinions on that. That was my opinion. Boy, that's really hard to, to say, but, but to execute a search warrant, to get a judge to give you a warrant, 
you you have to have probable cause. You have to feel convinced it's more, a judge. It's more likely than not that you're going to find some evidence that would tend to prove that a crime was committed. And what the problem with it is, is that you might have a set of facts that look like 51%, but then when you go do the search, you go, oh, that was a, that was a red herring. That, those facts are really not related. Those facts were coincidental. And in addition to that, what happens is when you're digging as hard as we were digging, <laughs> what happens is you find some people that have committed some crimes. You understand? But they aren't necessarily related to this crime in any way. And so you may go do a search warrant and you might even be hopeful it would find some evidence relating to this crime, but really your probable cause relates to something else altogether. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't want to come up with numbers on this because I will get the numbers wrong, but the police presence in Carroll County for a month period or longer there, probably two months, was so stunningly greater than it had ever been in history. Uh, I have dealt with FBI agents many times in my career, one at a time, you know, an FBI agent about some big fraud case or about steroids at crossing state lines or something. At one point there, there was, there was a time when there were probably 20, 25, I don't know, uh, FBI employees in Carroll County at one time. And so we had this FBI presence and then we had a huge state police presence. And then we had our sheriff's department working on all the time and the Delphi police department working all the time. And then officers, as I said, would come from other counties on loan. They would come and they would get assignments to go check on leads. Well, when you're checking on this many people, you're going to find some people up to no good. And it, it, so all sorts of things were happening during that period of time. Uh, and the other thing we were doing, and I, I've explained this a few times to people, is that, and the law has even changed on this since we were doing this, but when you have a crime in an area and you're trying to figure out, well, who could have been in that area? One thing we were doing was trying to figure out what cell phones had gone through that area. So we did a lot of subpoena for cell phone records where it wasn't a question of whether or not we thought a particular person did it. We're just trying to figure out who else could have possibly been, say, within five miles of that crime on that date. And so we put out a lot of paper uh, relating to uh, cell phone data back then. Yeah. When, when you're talking about a search warrant or an arrest warrant, there has to be probable cause that there's evidence of a crime. But when you're subpoenaing something that is subject only to subpoena power, then it only has to be reasonably related to a criminal investigation. So in, if you're doing a search warrant, a person actually, there has to actually be suspicion or probable cause of a crime. But when you're doing a subpoena, there only has to be, well, this logically could lead to evidence that would help you investigate a crime. And so, and then the courts have had a tough time when you talk about cell phone technology, determining what issues are privacy issues that call for search warrants and what issues are not so privacy issues that just call for subpoenas. And the courts are still trying to work that out. And during the period of time we were doing this, that the law was in flux, but we, we produced a lot of information just trying to figure out not again, who committed the crime, but who was physically present in the area. And of course, if you found there was somebody physically in the present in the area that, that was there for three hours or was there and had never been there before and has never been there since, well, you'd, you'd go talk to that person. That doesn't mean they committed the crime, but you'd know that very few people just passed through, would, would be near a cell phone tower near that crime and so on. So that was one thing that was going on. Well, as I say, the, it wasn't super hard at the time because, it's all, you know, all you really had to say was, though there, you had to look at the federal law and the state law, you go, there was a crime committed here. We want to know who was in that area during that period of time. And then all you get is you're not getting the contents. You're not getting the phone calls they made. 
all you're getting is this cell phone with this number pinged off that tower during that period of time. That was, it wasn't hard to get at that time. I suspect now, and I'm not up with this because I'm not keeping up with this moment. It's harder because the courts, there've been a lot of rulings since then about uh, what is necessary to get that information from cell phone companies. And I'm not an expert on that subject. Uh, it's in the millions. Uh, it, it's, it's an amount if we totaled it, I, mean, I, I say that there was a tremendous amount. I mean, this, the FBI had satellite relays in there and they had equipment in there. And then we had, if I tried to do the math, I mean, it continued to be people right now. There are officers right now. They're working all day, every day on this case. And if you just took the, the, the two Carroll County deputies, the sheriff, the deputy sheriff detectives who have been working full time almost continuously since this case started, if you just took their salaries alone, it's, I don't know, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, And there's many, many people. So it's in the millions of dollars. It's, as I say, it isn't that it, it isn't that that's all they were doing. It isn't that that's all they produced, but the amount of time that's been spent on it, the man hours, uh, equipment time, resources. I mean, we were, you know, we were, I can't, I can't tell you some things we were doing, but there was equipment used of all sorts. Uh, I, I can tell you this, I went over to Monticello and bought $2,000 worth of hard drives or something for video, <laughs> video work, uh, because we just we had we, we got printers and we got hard drives and we had cameras and we did all sorts of things to try to do logical investigative methods relating to trying to figure out an unknown suspect. You know, if a person would come back to a crime scene or they would be some particular place, that that sort of thing. And so an unbelievably large amount of money, but I wouldn't try to estimate it right here off the top of my head, but it was a huge number of police officers and continues to be a substantial number of police officers. And I hope, I hope every day that I'm going to get a phone call or I'm going to look at my newsfeed. I'm going to say, Oh, they got somebody, but I, I have never gotten that message to the state. I, I wish I had a number, but if you ask the state police, if you ask Kim Riley, the, the public relations officer, uh, he probably could come up with a number for you, but it's thousands. And there were some, there were some kind of silly ones, but people were really trying. And there was a lot of great information that came in. I mean, I took some of those calls myself and they're so busy early on. I actually made a phone one day. Yeah. That's right. Well, you know, when, the, when we've got a whole table, eventually they moved it to the FBI's call center. But at one point, we were just running a call center ourselves, and we had lots of volunteers. And these were all, they were, they tended to be like jailers and dispatchers, and people are used to taking these sorts of phone calls. And early in the morning, or at some particular hour, we'd only have one person, and there'd be three phones ringing. So I just answered the phone. I don't see that as a problem, but my, cause I told my, my belief on this is, and I don't believe anybody in law enforcement disagrees. Anything that will generate publicity about this case is okay with me because I believe. And one thing I had a difficulty, one of the Indianapolis TV stations couldn't understand why there was a press conference about Abby and Libby and not about the four girls that died in the fire in Florida. And I said, well, because we don't have any information to release. The reason there was a press conference, I've never called a press conference in my career that I can recall. In 22 years, I don't believe I ever called a press conference. The press conference was called because they had information and they wanted to get it out to the public to see if the public could help. And I still believe, as I said before, that people know things. Maybe they're afraid to say them. Maybe they think they're not important. Even though there have been thousands of tips, I still bet that doesn't mean that the next person to call won't tell the police something important. And so 
I've been around the country. I sometimes talk to people about this case, and I find people all the time that only vaguely know about it or only heard about it a little bit. And I believe there's a murderer out there and that somebody knows who that murderer is. And I want that person to call call the uh, FBI. I want them to report that so that our investigators can get on that case. And so the reason I agreed to do this is because if, if it'll help you guys, if it'll get more people to pay attention to it, if somebody else learns something about this case, I'm always going to be in favor of that. In those early days, there would be numerous TV trucks in downtown Delphi all night, every night in those early days. And I, it was really, it was funny. And I know a few of the news people, but it, it was almost like you couldn't walk across the street without running into some Indianapolis news person. I, it is. I, I just, like I say, I, the only the thing that's shocking is that it hasn't been solved, but I want to emphasize, I'll say this over and over again. It isn't because in my opinion, very competent people have worked very, very hard on it. It's not because of incompetence. It just, it just hasn't happened. It's just evidence hasn't been there. 